So just some just to make sure everyone understands sort of what's happening. We'll be showing the PowerPoint soon. In the meantime, the only thing that will appear on anyone's screen is the images of myself, Malik, and TL, all of the participants, audience members, your, your images will not show up on the screen. Ready to go? All right, go ahead and start. So before we begin, I'll give a brief image description. Of course, we're in a Zoom meeting and there are three boxes with three individuals in them. The first one is myself. When a person is signing, make sure we say, this is Esperanza talking, so. So for this webinar, um, we are broadcasting it live on Facebook. So we know that uh, it's it's a uh, it maybe there may be issues if you run into technical difficulties and you have to drop out or if your internet cuts out. Uh, we are recording this, so you may not be able to get back in, um, but there will be recordings available. I know this is going to be a, it's kind of a heavy webinar. It's a lot of information, a lot to learn, but we're going to work together and we're going to learn as a group. All right. So, you know, really the best way to approach this is to find, you know, three to five key ideas that kind of stick with you after the webinar and then, you know, go on and you can do a little more research on your own. So really just worry about finding those three to five key points. There will be uh, at least one, two, maybe two breaks during the webinar. Um, that'll give you some time to mentally process and kind of think through what you've been learning. We have a team here to support you and make sure that everything goes smoothly. The pacing isn't too fast or too slow. I know we want to value, you know, we value your time. So we want to get as much in as possible. So if you have any, uh, you know, want to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So, you know, we really value making sure that the information is being shared, you know, equitably. Of course, we're not going to be perfect, but we'll do our best. And we really appreciate your patience and understanding. So when it comes to the interpreting, you'll notice we don't take a very traditional approach. Um, you know, we are committed to equity when it comes to interpretation and to accessibility. So our commitment is making sure that everyone has a role, everyone is able to access all of the information equally in the most supportive way so that we're not leaving anyone behind. So you will see and you'll hear, uh, you know, so some of our, our different approaches to interpreting, you'll notice that we have captions, we have interpretation going on in English, we have interpretation going on in Spanish, and that's just part of the, the commitment we have to accessibility here with HERD. So just a quick content warning. As I said, this is going to be some very heavy information. A lot of it may be very sad. Some of it may be very traumatic. You know, these are some, you know, these issues may really bring up a lot of difficult emotions for you. Things may be triggering for some people. So I just want to let you know in advance, you know, don't, you know, don't worry about if those things come up for you. You know, this is, feel free. If you need to step away, that's absolutely okay. Take a few minutes, come back. Don't, you know, that's absolutely understandable. We know, you know, that, we have members of our audience who are formerly incarcerated themselves, and we're so grateful that you're joining us to, to, to listen to us and to be a part of this important event. We want to recognize the experiences that you've had and all the struggles that you've been through in your life. So we're just so grateful that you've chosen to join us. We have one member of our team, Micah who is running the live tweets. So if you wanna join in, the hashtag is hashtag death in prison. So as we're going along, anything you wanna add on Twitter, go ahead and make use of that hashtag. If you run into any accessibility issues, please go right ahead and contact the host, any barriers, any troubles, send us a quick message and we'll do our best to help you. Great. TL speaking, thank you so much. You know, making sure we get through all the checklists, making sure everything is clear. 
Esperanza says yes. All right. Now that we've got all that covered, you know, the information, the accessibility, we can get started with the real meat of the workshop here. So we want to begin our discussion by, by showing a quick video, just honoring and recognizing deaf and disabled, deaf blind, deaf and hard of hearing individuals who are currently incarcerated. We want to honor their lives, the things that they've been through, the struggles that they've experienced, you know, the, you know, those that are currently with us and those uh, that have experienced abuse, those that have, you know, have dealt with all of the challenges that the carceral system really causes. So we're gonna transfer over to this quick video. So we'll get that started, thanks. Esperanza speaking. What a beautiful, touching video that is. So, TL. So, I just want to explain a little bit what's, you know, so the audience knows what to expect. So, before we get started, I want to take a moment to really honor, a moment, a few moments to, to honor, you know, maybe some of you have been incarcerated yourselves, have been involved with the carceral system, you know, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes on inside, you know, a lot that we hold on to. So let's, let's hold this moment to really honor everyone who's been impacted by that system. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to Esperanza. Esperanza, Esperanza speaking here. So I'll make sure I just want to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page, and so we know kind of some of the terminology and the language that's going to get going to come up today. So the sign jail is like this. It uses two, so it looks like two. Prison has four fingers, right? So that's the difference between those two. Quarantine. So some of you may have seen our video that we recently posted talking about, um, you know, kind of what is the best sign for this term quarantine. Um, and you remember I had signed, oh, you know, staying at home. And so later, you know, we learned, we did a little, little kind of, kind of deep thinking about what does that mean quarantine and what's a good sign? Maybe staying at home, that maybe that's not the best way to kind of say that because, you know, not everyone is at home, you know. Some of us are, you know, some of us are, are stuck in, in one room. Some of us are stuck in a cell. Some of us are just, you know, staying at home may not be the safest place for us. Another term that you're going to see us use a lot is mass incarceration. So here's the sign for that. Prosecutor. Um, so, you know, 
that's sort of it's sort of like lawyer chase, right? So that's this is the sign we're using for prosecutor. Probation looks similar to the sign for warning, sort of a pat on the hand here. And parole is like this sign. This so we've got two different signs here. So you know, as we get through, as we work, as we go through this, uh, you you know. You may see us use a variety of different signs. Of course, we've learned all these signs from uh, people who, from deaf, uh, deaf and disabled folks who were incarcerated themselves, who've had to come up with their own ways to, to talk about this. So we make it a point to use their language. You know, in a lot of cases, there's not one right or wrong way to sign these things. You know, language, this, this is evolving over time as we learn more. It's, you know, the, the impact has been really, you know, it's been amazing, you know, just to see all of the different, <laughs> Right, I've seen that sign before. What other ones have you seen? I've seen this sign. Oh, this this one, different. Um, let's see here. Up here, up on the forehead. There's a variety of different signs, yes. So the criminal legal system. So as more signs come up, you know, we'll be, we'll continue to share, you know, and try to explain both the sign that we're using and what those concepts mean. Um, so I think that's the language that we're going to use for the webinar. So now allow me to introduce uh, the, the people who you'll be seeing the most today. And we'll do a quick image description. So there are three boxes on the screen. In the upper right, my name is Esperanza. Oh, here's my sign name, the E down by the chin. It's lovely to meet all of you. I'm a social worker and an advocate with HERD. So I work with, uh, with allies and formerly incarcerated individual myself. You know, it's always a little bit awkward doing these image descriptions. Um, you know, I'm a light-skinned Latinx uh, woman. I have dark brown hair and it's in a little a half ponytail and uh, tied up on the back of my head. I'm wearing a blue short sleeve t-shirt. Behind me, you'll see kind of a, uh, a, a brown leather couch and a white background. And so now allow me to introduce Malik. Hello, everyone. My name is Malik. Uh, I joined HERD recently, last year. Uh, I've been in public education for a long time. Um, I support HERD and its work across the country. I answer the hotline, talk with different folks who are incarcerated across the country. Um, my background, uh, as it relates to HERD, I work with a lot of people at, uh, providing support in different for the indigenous communities. Um, I have, this is an image description. I have a black shirt on. I have a white background. I have this pretty little flower hanging up behind me. And I have a, a stack of books. Now to you, Tia. Hello. My name is Tia Talila. So... So I'm a community activist and, a, and a, an attorney doing community advocacy work. So right now, I'm a, I'm, so what you see on your screen now, I'm a black person. I have a dark vest on, a blue short sleeve shirt. Uh, my, my, I have sort of a collared shirt and then I have a, a black beanie on. Behind me is a bookshelf, um, a couple of different things on the shelf and a, a sort of gray wall behind me. Esperanza says, thank you everyone for introducing yourself, you know. One more thought that came to me, uh, I want to make sure, you know, audience, you know, while we're going through this, if you have any questions, this is absolutely a safe place, please, you know, if you have any questions, there's, there's a link down below, it says Q and A, just go ahead and click that, it'll open a little box and you can type in your question. And, you know, one of our team will, will be gathering all the questions that we get and time permitting, you know, hopefully we'll have time to do a little Q and A after the webinar, all right, thank you. All right, I, TL says, I think uh, we'll turn it over to Malik and give us a quick, uh, quick summary. What is, you know, what is mass incarceration and, uh, you know, who is impacted? And uh, that'll lead us into our interview. Sure thing. The term mass incarceration. This is the sign that we've been using, but it started, a little, the timeline, I want to provide a brief overview of where that started. In the, in the 1970s and forward, 
Um, they had about 200 to 300,000 people in prison. And then all of a sudden it shot up to 2.3 million people quickly around the US. Less than 5% of the people who are incarcerated of the population uh, inside, 25% of those folks uh, are in prison. The population is, there's a lot of people. Uh, in the US, there's 2.2 million people who are in jails and prisons across the United States. 2.7 million children have parents who are incarcerated themselves. That is a lot of people. From the 70s to now, that's a 700% increase. And the amount of women who are going to prison has fastly increased as well. 75% of those women have children. One out of five people have mental health issues. One out of four uh, are in state and federal prisons uh, have disabilities. Four hundred to five hundred thousand disabled people across the United States are in jails and prisons. So that's a starking number. Coupled with the prison industrial complex and the education system, court systems, police departments, reentry uh, in and out of prison. So when you go home, reentry. I'd say about 80% of those folks that come out in less than a year will go back to prison. So when they are in prison, they get out one later, they're back for violations. Yeah, it's like a revolving door. So mass incarceration, most of the people who are in prison are marginalized folks, indigenous folks, black, brown, his Latinx, LGBTQ, It's mostly marginalized people. Esperanza, you had something that you wanted to add? Yeah, Esperanza, Esperanza speaking, I wanted to add, yeah, you know, you mentioned marginalized communities. You know, one of those communities is low income people. And so we notice a lot, a lot of people. Correct. Who end up, and of course, deaf and disabled people are often, you know, marginalized in that, in that other way as well, being low income. So all of that put together. Mass incarceration, uh, we're going to talk uh, a little bit more specific, but uh, there's, it's, it's latent content and it's impossible to explain everything today, but there's uh, a lot of organizations doing that work, projects uh, to sign with ASL to describe mass incarceration more in depth um, later on in this webinar. TL speaking here. So if you mind, uh, we're going to show a little video. Would you mind um, explaining a little bit about what's going to happen with the video later on? Yeah, let me hear from So the herd, coupled with different organizations, have been working on a project to translate what mass incarceration is. Because often, uh, when you research on the computer and you try to find information about mass incarceration in ASL, it's really hard to find. It's mostly English product instead of ASL. So that's what we're doing. Heard as an organization has met, has created a project to provide that information in ASL so that people can fully understand what mass incarceration is and what the impacts on marginalized communities are. It's happened to it's happened to me. It can happen to you. It can happen to anybody. It's true. Thank you. So TL signing here. So, you know, of course, it's hard to summarize the whole, you know, mass incarceration system, but, you know, this is something that started many, many, many years. So we're talking Slavery. about generations, right. yeah. you know, even before that, you know, if you think of the indigenous communities who were, you know, who were the first marginalized, people, you know, people who were, who were rounded up, you know, and that was how, the, that's how this whole system got started. So it's important that we recognize and name that long, long history, that truth, you know, time is limited here today. So getting into all of it, but I just want to throw that out there to maybe inspire some of you to do a little more research on your own and pass that on. Yes, and I also want to add, emphasize that 
I want to remind everybody, no one um, knows how many actual deaf and hard of hearing folks we have in jails and prisons across the United States because it's not tracked. There are a lot of statistics out there and they have a, a, maybe a percentage of how many disabled people, but they don't track deaf and hard of hearing folks in the United States. So it's hard to know how many people are incarcerated. Yeah, Esperanza talking here. And just to add to that comment, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, you know, you know, we know that there are a lot of deaf, hard of hearing, disabled individuals who are in jails and prisons, but oftentimes they're sort of overlooked as if they're unimportant. So, you know, oftentimes, you know, when, uh, you know, when a person enters the system, you know, jail, prison, through the court system, you know, then they first get into the system, um, you know, that's, you know, it's, people identify themselves as, you know, their own way. So people don't necessarily, they don't count disabled people. So they get thrown into the system and the system itself doesn't necessarily identify them, identify them as a person with a disability, as deaf, as hard of hearing. And so we have to find this information, you know, almost in a very grassroots way by meeting people. And that's one of the problems is it's very difficult to, to you know, to capture this information because the system itself doesn't really, you know, doesn't really offer that information. So we have to kind of do that digging ourselves. This is leak signing. And then often uh, in the court system, they don't provide access for people to accommodate their needs, especially folks who are disabled. And that also leads to mass incarceration. So the crux of it is actual accessibility and accommodating people from marginalized communities who require accommodation. <laughs> T.O. here, let me just add one more thing. I don't want to cut folks off here. You know, um... So it's really important to remember that here in the United States, we have a long history of labeling different types of behaviors as, you know, quote, unnatural or, you know, saying, oh, this behavior is not okay. Or, you know, you know, you know, sort of marginalizing black people or marginalizing, you know, different groups of people, um, you know, sort of, you know, create criminalizing different behaviors. And that's part of how that system sort of has just collected up such a huge number of, you know, members of our communities, black, brown, deaf, disabled, indigenous you know, people, you know, low income folks, you know, just because all of these behaviors or all these identities have been made into, you know, have been labeled as criminal. And so, you know, that's, that's sort of some of the content that we get into with this discussion is really trying to understand it's not just about, you know, like what was just said, um, you know, you mentioned recidivism, right? People who kind of wind up keep getting stuck, you know, rotating in and out of the system. And we tend to blame that person. Oh, they just keep messing up. They just keep spinning out. They just keep getting thrown back into the system. But the problem is the system itself. It's not the individuals, right? You know, it's the system itself that, you know, traps people and they can't get out of it. So it's critical that we keep that in mind. You know, that's, I just wanted to throw that in there. I <laughs> just wanted to add that. Yes, I also have something I want to add too. This is Malik Sinan. I think it's important to add that jails and prisons are not designed for people who have mental health. It actually makes them worse. As Esperanza mentioned, a uh, person might have one or two disabilities when they go to prison, but once they get to prison, it exacerbates. And there are many people who are impacted by mental health in the prison system. I can keep adding more and more, but uh, for example, police often when they interact with people, uh, I'd say 30 to 50% of those folks, um, people who are uh, prison and disabled, they, they're negatively racialized. There's a high percentage of uh, people with, with disabilities who are, people with disabilities are disproportionately likely to be killed by police officers. Esperanza adding here. Um, so I, I just wanted to comment about, um, you know, what was just said going back, you know, sort of uh, we were em emphasizing, oh, what was it? What was it? It was, okay, here's my thought. Got it. So I wanted to recognize here that, you know, you know, people may enter the, 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 the carceral system, you know, they go in and they may have no, no prior history, but once you get and, you know, the impact on your mental health, the impact on your physical, your emotional, your spiritual, all of those things, all of that creates barriers and it tends to impact people long term. It tends to lead to kind of an overall just degeneration of functioning. Tio, okay, last comment, last comment, I swear. Promise. <laughs> 
The point is, prison is not good for anyone. Doesn't matter who you are. You know, no, you know, it's never, it, you know, that experience for anyone. You know, in terms of communication, in terms of, you know, connecting with your family, in terms of your relationships, you know, just in terms of human survival, you know, it just is, you know, we can talk in depth about that alone. And there's just so many layers when you add in other, you know, other types, other identities, other challenges. So just to underscore that. Wonderful. I think we're, uh, we can actually go on to the next Ready to discussion. show the video? Oh, the video. Interview. So we're going to take a quick breather, a little break. You know, we've got a couple of formerly incarcerated folks joining us. You know, I know they're a little new to technology. It can be a little rough uh, getting adjusted. You know, we've trying to work together, work with them and make sure. Um, so if, uh, make sure we've got Brandon ready so that we can pull him up. So we'll forget this uh, Esperanza. So we're going to have Brandon come and join us. Esperanza, would you mind giving a little bit of information here? Getting this set up. So while we're waiting on uh, on Brandon to get to join us, you know, I just want to give you like kind of a kind of a picture of the situation here. You know, talking about the criminal legal system. So, in general, we, you know, we know deaf, deaf blind, deaf, uh, deaf with disabilities, you know, deaf and hard of hearing people in general tend to are more likely to be arrested or more likely to wind up, you know, punished, wind up spending time, you know, because of the barriers to communication. You know, you know, for a hearing person that, you know, they, they're able to quickly get in touch with a lawyer and they can have that, you know, that quick exchange, that communication, they can, you know, quickly get in touch with their family, you know, they get thrown in jail, they, you know, they make that call, hey, mom, I've been, you know, locked up, can you come get me, you know, they have access, you know, all these different resources that they can grab onto, you know, it's not, not, not perfect, of course, you know, you know, there, but there's, you know, there's a certain amount of privilege there, but, you know, for a deaf person, once, you know, get tossed into jail and there's no communication, you know, there's no information, you know, the police show up and, you know, you wind up arrested and, you know, and so, you know, while you are incarcerated, whether in jail or in prison, you may be the only deaf person there. So you may deal with language deprivation, you know, there's no communication and that impacts your mental status. So Brandon, you know, during the interview may talk a little bit about that, you know, kind of what that has meant, what was his experience was like, um, you know, as, as a, you know, kind of what that was like being deaf in prison and, you know, not necessarily having anyone to talk to, you know, and then, you know, that kind of, you know, your time may wind up being extended, um, you know, you're, because you don't have access to parole. And so you're not able to, you're stuck in prison even longer than you otherwise would be. You're not released early on parole because, you know, you don't have access to that communication. You don't have access to the programs and interpreters and the things that would make it possible to shorten your sentence. You know, for, you know, for a hearing person, they may be able to do that kind of thing and a deaf person might not have access. So they wind up spending more time in prison than they otherwise would, you know, and when you combine that with the isolation of prison, with the lack of language, I mean, the lack of connection, you know, I'm, I'm not to speak of, you know, people who are innocent, who are wrongfully convicted, you know, and they wind up incarcerated, but they can't, you know, they're not able to access the deaf community because they're in prison, you know, they have no, there's no video phones, there's no way for them to communicate with anybody. Um, so, you know, that's, I just wanted to, you know, that's just part of the struggle that, you know, deaf and hard of deaf folks deal with when they're incarcerated. So I wanted to sort of throw that out there. Esperanza says, yes, all right, thank you so much. And now we are ready to bring in, uh, bring Brandon in and have him join in. Hooray, we ready for Brandon. All right, thank you so much. Brandon has been through a lot. Uh, and today we really appreciate it. It's not easy to really come out and share that experience, but he's gonna do that with you today and share his journey. Brandon's here. Can everybody see him? Are we able to see Tio? Brandon, can you see Tio? Tio says, yep, I yes. can see, perfect. Can Great, see good, good. All right, Brandon, thank you for yes. joining us. 
So just to get, you know, loop our audience in, um, this is Brandon Cobb, a uh, formerly incarcerated individual, and we're so grateful to have, we're thrilled to have him joining us to share some of his experiences, you know, as a formerly incarcerated deaf person. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing, sharing some of your story. Are you ready for the interview? Yes, yes, I am ready. Good, good. So I have four questions for you. And so that's uh, what we'll get started here. So my first Perfect. question for you is, so when you were first arrested and they sent you to court, did you have equal access to communication using ASL I did as not. an interpreter? No. Don't mind, would you mind kind of talk a little more about that? Uh, I did uh, write to them that I wanted an interpreter, but they just ignored me. I asked if I could contact my family, my mom, try to use the TTY, but uh, they just ignored me. They wouldn't let me use it. It was hard to communicate with them, especially because I was in handcuffs. It was hard enough to write, but I didn't have any type of interpreter. So just to clarify, so you were saying, you know, it's hard to sign, you know, because you were, you were handcuffed. You literally couldn't sign. Correct. Finally, when the interpreter come, but I couldn't get my point across because I was shackled. So I didn't have any way and I was frustrated. Yeah, they had it connected to a belt and they had me shackled up and I was just trying to be patient, but um, I was trying to get the interpreter to understand and to get the shackles off of me so that I could communicate, but they just ignored me. It was very hard. I couldn't express myself. Um, so I just had to wait it out and uh, they just couldn't understand what I was trying to communicate because I was shackled. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a barrier. You're not even able to communicate with your own lawyer, you know, getting through the court system. That's, wow, that sounds tough. Correct. All right. So my second question is, as a deaf person in jail and in prison, you know, could you talk to me about a little bit about that experience? So, you know, the intake process, right, right when you're in the receiving, you know, and they, they, they start getting you set up, you know, um, uh, were you able to get interpreters as you were going into the system? Did you have access to video phones? Tell us a little bit about what that, what that looked like. Sure. When I first went to jail, uh, I asked for an interpreter, but I didn't have one. So anyways, they had a TTY, but it was broken. And I have any way to call. It was hard in jail. This was in the county jail. When I went to the state prison, uh, they didn't have any TTYs either, and it was hard as well. They didn't have any video phones, I couldn't contact. So anyways, what I had to do was send out snail mail and wait for people to write me back. They set up a video phone, I'd say somewhere around 2018, and then yeah. I was finally oh, able to make a call. But yeah, I mean, it was a long, long time, it was terrible. Uh, I just felt like uh, they didn't have equal access for the deaf guys. And you see all the hearing people calling their families on the wall, but it's like, where's where's the deaf, where's, where's our access? We can't hear, so we can't pick up the phone. So we need video phones, but we're isolated. Right. Yeah. I mean, for a hearing person who's incarcerated, you know, they've got the, 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 you know, the set of phones all up on the wall. And so all right. they do is walk up and they can just grab the phone and start talking. But if, you know, if you're a person who uses ASL, you want to use a video phone, you know, it took all that time to get mm -hmm. that all set up. That was so late into the you know, time there. You know, it was you too to late. So much, it was you too know, late. All that delayed communication, you know, being able to get in touch with your family and your lawyer and all the things you might do with a phone. That's, that's right. This is Malik. When you finally got access to a video phone, I think you said like two years ago in 2018, were there other deaf guys in the dormitory using it? Yes, there were other deaf guys. But prior to that, they didn't have any video phones or TTYs either. I think they had one guy had been there for 23 years or something like that. He didn't have a TTY, he didn't have a video phone. I just can't even imagine. He had been sending out mail back and forth for all these years, not much because um, he didn't have anybody to write to, but uh, he, he wasn't used to a video phone and he signed, but when they finally installed the video phone uh, in the 90s, when he went to prison, he didn't know what a video phone was. He was used to the TTY. So when the video phone got there, he was so excited. He was like, whoa, look at this technology. So we helped him uh, navigate it, but I came home and they installed a video phone right before I left. 
which is better for the guys. Uh, it was better for me because I was able to uh, call home and, and, and talk to people. But imagine not being able to communicate with anybody on the outside who signs and your signing skills just kind of decline. I can't imagine all those years in prison without. And then so finally, uh, being able to communicate with some folks on the outside who are deaf helps you, uh, you know, with your signing skills and you kind of yeah. have language deprivation. TL, I just wanted to add, you know, what you just mentioned with the video phone, finally getting the video phones installed in 2018. That required, you know, years of, you know, years of work in the, in the legal system, 10 years of fighting and fighting and fighting, you know, and, you know, for what? Just to get a video phone, you know, oh, you know, people might get sued, we can get sued, all that kind of stuff. The system just kept blocking it off. That was the real reason. Right. You know, you know, our community is in prison, and so it's important that we kind of get these things going. So I pass it over to Esperanza or M M Malik. Malik. Yeah, I want to add something to that. The ADA... Um, you know, they always say that the ADA law has been in place all these years, but not in jails and prisons. Uh, it obviously doesn't apply. So they used to have a person that came around and talked about the ADA, but they would deny us when we would ask for video phones and they would sign. Um, I, it was on paper that it was just to have one, but I thought the person there was supposed to be supporting us, you know, the ADA coordinators. I never understood why they wouldn't help us get the things that we need. They were supposed to be doing their job, but they would listen to us, but never did anything. They never helped us. When the ACLU and HERD got involved, I started to learn more about my rights and different things, and they were supporting us to help us get the things that we need. They really educated us on what it was supposed to be like. It wasn't easy, though. I'm going to tell you, we had a hard time. TL, just a quick last, you know, because, of course, we want to – hear what, what uh, Brandon has to say what you know what he's sharing but you know you know people often they think of they don't realize that the ADA doesn't really provide enough coverage you know um you know it's not really a, a liberatory piece of legislation it has some rights to it yeah but you know and some civil rights and you know of course that's that's very important but you know we need to be aware that you know the culture and the attitude of, you know the, of the community it's like that are impacted like our communities that are experiencing this the way that this impacts is our lives you know our community members who are incarcerated, right? You know, we really have to keep doing a lot more, you know, a lot more advocacy work, you know. You know, oftentimes lawsuits have to happen to get some kind of change, you know. A deaf person, you know, says, well, I wanna sue because I don't have accessibility, you know, and they end up, you know, they deal with all of this abuse and these terrible things and all of that has to happen before something gets recognized. And we have to realize, you know, their, you know, their experiences often, you know, that ends up being kind of the solution is more harm has to happen before anything gets improved, right. it's you, know? you know, and we just can't accept that as the way that we're going to make change. Uh, Esperanza, Esperanza, thank you, Tia, so much for adding that, you know, it's important to recognize that. So, you know, and Brandon, thank you so much for sharing. So I just want to kind of quickly summarize some of what you just said here, you know, so you know, of course, there was no equal access while you were incarcerated, right? You kept asking for things, asking, you know, yeah. and, you know, asking for help and things, you know, your, your grievances, your requests would get, would be denied. And right. that's the case for a lot of deaf and disabled individuals. And I want, you know, of course, you want to recognize the people who were, you know, long time incarcerated for years and years and years. You know, you mentioned someone over 30 years, 20 years, you know, no, even five years or even two years, you know, with that kind of isolation in prison, the impact that has on your mental status, you know, you're just totally right. alone. You know, you're, you're the only deaf person. There's no one to talk to. There's no communication, you know, that kind of struggle. And, you know, the way that just sort of the helplessness that that comes with when you're just stuck there, you know, years, you know, you know, it doesn't matter how many years, the impact that that has on you is just tremendous. That's right. It's terrible. Oh, was there... Should we move on to the next question or you, did you want to add a little more? Come on with the question, that's fine. Okay, so my third question. So we've already sort of touched on this part, but if you wouldn't mind kind of giving a little more, you know, prison, your time while you were incarcerated, how does that impact your, you know, your physical health, your, your language, your signing, your mental health? Could you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, I definitely suffered. Uh, I was in isolation in the hole for like three weeks. Uh, I didn't even know why I was there. They just put me there. There was no reason. Nobody was communicating with me. I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't write back and forth. They just, they ignored me. 
I couldn't go outside. I couldn't watch TV. I couldn't do anything. It was dark in the hole, and I was just suffering. I couldn't really sleep well. Um, I was up all night. I felt like I was going nuts. I just, uh, it was driving me crazy. I, I just, I wanted to hurt somebody. I wanted to get revenge because they put me in this hole for no reason. It wasn't right. They had so many different problems in prison, especially in the jail. In the county jail, they just close doors all day. It's loud. People, uh, you know, they try to attack you from behind. Uh, there's just a lot of violence there. In the state prison, eh, you know, uh, you can kind of, you can talk to people in there. You can kind of communicate with the guards or whatever. You can understand a little bit better about what's going on. People will help you out a little bit more. They would occasionally provide interpreters, but in jail, it was hell. It's just violent and people are constantly on you and it's just, it's it's a lot of pain and suffering. Yeah, that's for Rhonda talking here. Yeah, it's, you know, it's- And my I mean, signing skills, I mean, they decline. You know, just, you know, just seeing, you know, one, you know, that one, you know, one person got thrown into a cell, you know, no ability to communicate. And then they stick you further in the shoe. They stick you in the hole, like you called it, right? you know, you know, that you know, just the complete control over that person, right? The way that they just get utterly neglected. It's, it's worse. Terrible, it's terrible. It's worse and worse and worse. That's why it's important to have deaf people. And if they put you in the cell with deaf folks, then that would be fine. Right. For example, they put hearing people together yeah, and they can communicate right. with themselves all day, but you have a deaf person, you put in there by themselves yeah. and they don't have anybody to communicate. So, like, for example, they ship people all over the place. They transfer uh, hearing people to different facilities. I just didn't understand why they didn't bring all the deaf folks in one area, like 10 or 15 people in one spot. I just don't understand that. They'll transfer you to all these different prisons and separate everybody. Yeah, you know, as Pranta signing here, you know, you know, they always they tend to take people as far away as possible from their home area. You know, oftentimes it'll be, you know, five, six, seven hours away. They're, you know, far, far, far from where they're from. And, you know, that sort of, that ends up really impacting the family and friends are not able to go visit their incarcerated loved one. They're not able to, you know, help, help them. No, I, I understand. It's terrible. You know, I, you know, you know, that the way that they do, I just, you know, it's awful. Um, In court, I don't know. Uh, I saw that some of the hearing people in court, it seemed like uh, they got less time than the deaf. Like in, in deaf people, when they go to court, yeah. it seemed like they got more time. Yeah, like Brendan just said, you know, deaf people, deaf disabled people, and you know, in general, oftentimes the, you know, their sentences are longer than hearing people. They spend more time in prison, um, you know, and part of the, you know, there's a number of reasons behind that, but part of that, you know, as, you know, it's, it's that, you know, when you're charged with a crime, you know, the, the, you know, so, for example, you know, someone might get charged with sentences to two years, but they might ultimately spend three, four, five years. And the reason that a deaf person might spend so much longer has to do with the communication access because, you know, they're not able to communicate in court. And so they wind up with their sentence right. extended further and further and further, you know, just just as one example. Um, and that, you know, further traumatizes cause further harm. And to y'all, I just want to, you know, kind of recognize, you know, what, what Brandon just signed, the way that sentences keep getting right. extended longer and longer. Yeah, because you don't have any interpreters and you get stuck right. in the yes, system. People say, you know, I can't find an interpreter, can't find an interpreter, can't find an interpreter. So you spend so much yeah. longer. And it's and like you, you get lost in the system. You know, you end up spending, you know, end up maxing out your whole sentence and then they, you know, they throw you in front of the parole board. You know, oftentimes, you know, it just gets extended and extended and extended, you know. Mm -hmm. And that just makes it that much harder to really kind of resist the way that impacts how, you know, for that individual, how that impacts how they, they feel. So yeah, yeah, Esperanza, if you want to continue. Esperanza here. Fourth question, last question for you. Um, so when you left prison, when you were finally released, were you able to get full access to, you know, um, to parole, probation, um, parole. You know, free entry no. services, any of that? I finally got out but I didn't have any interpreter for parole. I didn't have no interpreter. I figured that they would know that I'm deaf, but they still didn't provide any communication access. I kept asking them for an interpreter, but they would communicate without an interpreter. They would give me a little piece of paper and they asked me to sign it. Uh, I would prefer to have, you know, like I didn't, I would just wanted to know what the paperwork says, like a legal document, you know what I mean? And 
I just, I didn't, there's a whole lot of yeah, jargon on there that I just didn't way. understand. And I wanted to understand using sign language. That's why it's important to have an interpreter. That way I can understand the legal documents that I'm signing. I mean, it's risky to sign this stuff. You can go back to jail. I didn't want to do that. I was, so anyways, I yeah. signed the paperwork because yeah. I didn't want to risk going back. I mean, they have the authority right. to do whatever they want to do. <laughs> yeah, they have the authority. Yeah. I just felt kind of stuck. I was frustrated. So I signed the paperwork. I just had to take what they gave me. Wow. I would get some help from friends, but uh, without an interpreter. They tried to explain it to me. I mean, that's a big risk that you had to take there. Right. I signed the paper without, you know, totally understanding what you were putting your name to. You know, that's that's quite a risk. You know, of course, anytime, you know, anytime, you know, deaf person, you're being asked to sign this paper, right. you know, that's an accommodation that is absolutely required. They, you know, they need an interpreter who, you know, has the knowledge, has those skills, who, you know, is able to, you know, make sure that you fully understand that document that, that you're signing. So, you know, the process, you know, think about it, like, you know, if you, you know, this is like a, you know, if you are signing a contract for your, your, your agreements, it's things you need to follow for your probation or your parole. And if you violate any of those, they throw you back in prison. Correct. You know, so exactly. You know, so you need to fully understand every single little detail. You know, these are very strict rules that you've got to follow. Any kind yeah, it's, of it's very jargon. They just throw you right back in jail. So it's so important that you have full access and full communication to everything on that document that you were being asked to sign so that you, you know, reduce that list, that risk of, you know, being tossed back in jail. This is Malik. For example, uh, with parole, all the different stipulations about like, you have to be home at a right certain time yeah. or, or you, you might break, violate yeah. and go back to jail. There's a bunch of different things that you need to know. For example, with law enforcement, uh, you know, you, you may be reading something, you have this document, you don't really know, you know, but, you know, they, 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 they give you, you know, like Brandon said, they give you all these things you have to sign and agree to, you know, and so, it's, and then you wind up spending more and more time in jail because you violated parole without even knowing. And so you, maybe you don't have an interpreter when you go to meet with your parole officer. And so you get out and you're so excited, you show up for your first day for your meeting with your parole officer and there's no interpreter. And so you have to put that off two, three, four months, you know, and then you come back and then you wind up thrown back in jail. Um, so Tia, you wanted to add something? He also I can hear. So, you know, so of course we talked about, you know, uh, so day programs, right? So hearing people have access to these programs. So a person gets arrested for, you know, DUI, for example, you know, drunk driving and they get arrested, you know, for a hearing person, often they can go through a program. So they don't actually end up going in, in prison. And so they go through sort of a recovery program, you know, some sort of substance abuse, some, some sort of rehab you know, for a deaf or hard of hearing person with no interpreter, they don't know that they have that option. And so they just get immediately thrown into jail. You know, there's, right. you know, they don't have that, you know, they don't know, they don't know that there's this other program to sort of take them outside of that system initially, giving them, giving them a second chance, you know, the court system, the prison system, you know, it, you know, they just want to just toss you right in jail because they can just, you know, if they have that, they have that, that set up for you, um, you know, and then, you know, when anything related to addiction, you know, and, and disability, it's so important to look at, to know how those things are related. So there's, you know, five characteristics of people who are incarcerated, four out of the five, you know, pass, you know, pass away due to overdose. So they, you know, this is a huge problem because, you know, prison is such a traumatic experience. You know, this is a lot of suffering. And, you know, oftentimes people have no access to any kind of programming, anything that, so, you know, you know, deaf disabled people, they don't have any, any access to any of these rehab type programs that they might, that hearing people might be able to access. And so that, you know, the consequences of that, you know, is that there are more likely to die of these kinds of things. So it's important that we recognize just the myriad barriers that show up. So, um, you know, as, you know, one of the, you know, a deaf and disabled incarcerated person who passed away recently was on the list in 2017. One of the people that we showed in our video, he's a young guy. His family paid so much to send him to programs out of state to support him, you know, through his, his addiction, um, you know, but they didn't realize that, you know, they didn't provide any interpreters. So he, you know, he just, they didn't know what was going on. So they, you know, they, they, he, he left because he didn't know, you know, he didn't know what was going on. He, you know, he signed paperwork and he didn't know what kind of help he was, 
you know, getting access to his family had paid so much money to send him out of state. And then, you know, he got thrown into prison, you know, and they wound up overdosing, you know, and that's where, you know, that's the consequences of this, right? You know, we can't continue with this system working in the way that it's working. Um, you know, we try to picture the impact on, you know, on families, on community members, you know, of the whole, you know, prison system, the whole complex, the way people are getting, you know, pulled out of recovery spaces and into these prison spaces, you know, it is absolutely not okay. I just, just had to throw that out there. Esperanza, you know, Tia, I just want to, you know, expand on that. You know, absolutely. Thank you so much. So those are all the questions I had for Brandon. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate the discussion, you know, and I hope, you know, the audience got something, you know, understands, you know, the, the difficulties that, you know, uh, that folks are going through who are currently incarcerated in, in, in that process. So hopefully that kind of helps us clear up, you know, kind of a little bit better understanding right. what's happening. I hope uh, that the government and, and, you know, states really understand what deaf people go through in prison, but also with the COVID-19 right now, I've seen on the news, plenty of interpreters are showing up on the news, and now we're more encouraged to watch the news, but in jails and prisons, they need to provide the same type of access with video phones so that it's equitable yeah, yeah. on the inside and the outside so that we can understand what's going on. We need to know different things, history, all, all types of backgrounds, information, so that we can get better and we can come home. Yes. Better. Thank Since you, Brandon. Thank you so much. I so agree. Yes, thank you. Thank you. you. You have a good day. Bye. Love y'all. Esperanza talking. Oh. TL signing here. So uh, we just got to note quickly um, so that some of the, um, the captions, one of the interpreters noted that the captions are covering, um, covering, hand, covering our hands. So I just want to check in. Better. So that's Bronze saying thank you. Just one more thank you for Brandon. You know, thank you so much for sharing your story. You know, the you know the you know deaf and disabled people who are incarcerated. You know, just that complete lack of access throughout the entire system, from arrest to court to jail to prison, and often the reentry system as well. You know, just that struggle with just absolutely no access. So thank you so much for you know the the, the communication deprivation and the impact. You know, sharing about how that impacts your mental health. You know, and just oh so the just so much. So really, Brandon, thank you so much for, you know, your willingness to join us and share with us. You know, I, it, it, it's got to be tough to just get that open with everyone. So thank you so much for sharing. So Tio saying, you know, we, I think we promised a break. Um, so we do have a couple of videos, but I think we'll, you know, We'll just encourage you to watch those videos on your own, you know, as a follow up. We'll send out an email to everyone who is here today with with those links um, just to save some time so that we have more time to, to really cover the topics that we wanted to cover, particularly with COVID-19 and how that's impacting deaf and disabled people who are currently incarcerated. Um, so we'll take a quick break now, maybe two, three minutes um, just to, you know, and then we'll come back. We'll hop back on. We'll get into the discussion. Uh, we'll talk specifically about COVID-19 during the break. Um, we want to show you a little video that we have here of um, it's uh, Johnny, another formerly incarcerated individual. Um, you know, and he talks a bit about what um, talks, you know, the quarantine kind of that word, right? So that's, you know, so we know that, that being staying at home, these stay at home orders and the experience of being in prison and how they're really very different experiences. Um, so during the break, we'll show that. Um, give you a chance to kind of watch that. If you want to grab some water, a bite to eat, use the bathroom real quick, you know, you do what you need to do. And then we'll show that video. And then, um, so uh, Bronza and, and Malik, you can turn our cameras off. We'll just show the video and uh, we'll come back soon.
I want to talk today about COVID-19 and the sign of prison. So isolation. Hey, it's freezing up. Uh, the, the video is freezing up. Uh, TL or somebody is on there. Can you fix it? Is the video freezing for everyone? Yes. Yes. I want to talk today about the difference between the COVID-19 sign and nah, it's still freezing up to you. Roxanne? Roxanne, can you try to play it from yours? Yes, I will try. Are you able to see? No. Can you see an internet screen open at all on my computer? No. Okay, well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. We'll just wait for everyone to join us uh, after the break here. Like was saying, my uh, my battery's a little low, but I should be able to make it through the rest of the webinar. Where is Malik? Hello. Okay. 
as far as you're ready to get going. That's you. Yeah. So we'll try to figure out that maybe we can show the video at the end. Um, we'll just, we'll, you know, we've had our break, we'll move forward. So Esperanza is talking here. So I hope everyone had a nice restful break. So now we wanna transition and talk specifically about COVID-19 and its impact on people who are currently incarcerated. So I'll pass it over to Malik. Hello everyone, it's Malik again. We're gonna talk about uh, the signs for COVID-19 and, and the prison side for people in prison. So uh, people in prison and jails, uh, there's about um, 25 to 200,000 people who have tested positive. So uh, a lot of those folks are prison staff who have tested positive. All together, 28, uh, prison guards have died. People in prison, uh, 373, I believe, have died. The data that has been collected still hasn't, uh, it's being underreported. They haven't given a full calculation of every, all of the, the testing done. And they still haven't tested everybody in prison either. They're still uh, collecting data and providing tests. So those numbers um, are, they haven't been counted correctly. So I'm gonna explain a little bit uh, about what herd has been doing during COVID-19 and this pandemic. We've been working hard to um, provide information and talk to people who are incarcerated across the United States through our video hotline on video phone. That's uh, one of my responsibilities, that's what I do. Before COVID hit, people called all the time on the hotline. I was taking notes, collecting data from people, um, just communicating with them. But since the pandemic hit, uh, a lot of those jails and prisons have locked people down and they're not able to make calls. So that means less access to communication, less access to video phones, less access in general. So we have a hard time taking a pulse of how everybody's doing. The hotline calls substantially dropped. So we've been working hard to um, send letters and to different people in prison, uh, also provide support for people who are getting out, uh, folks who are high risk, who are older, uh, who have weak immune systems, who have health issues, underlying health issues. So that's where our folks have been thus far, just writing letters, um, trying to get people out of prison who are suffering from these conditions that I just mentioned. Yeah, Esperanza here, I just wanted to add that, you know, in addition to that work, trying to allow, you know, trying to get people out of prison, you know, people who are who were due to be released very soon, you know, their, their time got short, you know, and so we're trying to fight to get them released now instead of making them wait, you know. So people who were like, you know, within the next year, we're already supposed to be released. So saying, well, just, you know, let them go now, you know. So I just wanted to add that into what you're saying, the work that we're doing. Right. So that's what we've been doing, collecting information, helping people, trying to help people get out, providing information to uh, our group, uh, all our followers, and raising attention to what's going on in prison and jail, people who are suffering because of the pandemic inside and the many barriers. Uh, a lot of families are concerned about their loved ones, wondering whether they're doing okay. We're getting emails and contacted on a regular basis, and we're trying to provide as much support as it is. It's really not all that easy because of the influx of people. So we're contacting folks, um, you know, making sure they're doing okay, uh, seeing if when we do talk to them, if they're providing access during the COVID-19, and those are the types of questions. Um, but that's the legwork that we've been doing. We've partnered with a few hearing organizations um, who provide services to deaf and, and deafblind, hard of hearing, trying to connect the dots uh, during this crisis. Uh, Herd is a very small organization with a lot of work, and it's easy to get overwhelmed, especially since COVID-19 has hit. It's been, it's just been uh, a lot of extra work. Um, there's a lot of dangers right now. 
uh, for example, like the CDC recommendations, uh, the health center and different stuff like that, wearing a mask, uh, providing interpreters, washing your hands with soap, um, hygiene, drinking lots of water, healthy foods, staying within six feet of each other. Um, but people aren't really practicing that. So uh, it's, in prison, yeah, you, you it's, can't practice the CDC's recommendations. So as for the talking, I just wanted you know to add to people who are prisons or jails, you know, they're so far behind on this information regarding, you know, coronavirus, the COVID-19, you know, as the, as the pandemic has spread, you know, you know, since January, as it has just made its way throughout the country, you know, people who are in jails and prisons, you know, they started finding out, you know, when did they start hearing about it? You know, they about maybe a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, you know, just imagine Two, it, like three months ago. Yeah. And that information, you know, getting, you know, trying to save the lives of people who are currently in jails or prisons, you know, they have no idea. They, you know, they didn't find out, you know, didn't realize until, you know, that, that could happen to me, right? You know, so this is a very dangerous time to be incarcerated. It's a serious issue. Right, what Esperanza said. We've heard many of stories about things that are going on all over the country and it's truly sad. As Americans, uh, we watch the news and the TV through closed caption, different things, but like the state government, interpreters as the governors and different things, um, as they are providing information, people incarcerated, they don't even know what's going on. They have no clue. Uh, they have to ask, you know, what does COVID-19 mean? Or if we ask them, they're like, I don't know, maybe just like flu or something. You know, they're not even aware of what's going on because they don't have accessibility and interpreters, for example. Uh, in March, they had a warden and he brought an interpreter once uh, to talk to the staff and stuff about COVID-19. Right, TLC. And yeah. that happened uh, because Heard sent a letter demanding that they provide access the to ACLU, that information. Yeah. So the prison said, okay, okay, well, we get an interpreter. And after that was done, it was a one and done. They never provided an interpreter again. So I asked one of the guys there, hey, have you had an interpreter since then for updates and stuff? They said, no, we haven't seen an interpreter since. Yeah, Esperanza here, you know, just, you know, we have to continue. They have to keep providing interpreters so they can keep providing this updated information on, you know, that one and done, like, you know, that's a perfect example, right? You know, sort of earlier on, we talked about the system, how it tends to, you know, they sort of, oh, well, we provided you that one accommodation that one time, but no, that's not enough. We have to do the whole system. You know, it's not just, you know, there's so much more that's required, you know, so this is a perfect example. So TL, just quickly adding here, just, um, we're down to 15 minutes left. And so I just wanted to add that, you know, there's a couple of places where we know, we are aware that they have been providing interpreters that have been explaining, you know, one, so here's, we're talking about in all of the United States, we can talk about, we know of one place after so much legal work, getting organizations involved, sending all these letters, one place provided an interpreter, you know, this is, this is an issue of life and death, you know, in terms of the, the pandemic and, you know, it's just, anyway, Malik. <laughs> Right. So Heard has been explaining to prisons and jails what they're supposed to be doing during COVID-19. Um, and we're trying to also speak to the guys that are incarcerated, you know, sharing what's going on during this pandemic. But really, it's the system's responsibility to communicate with people who are incarcerated, not ours. That's what we do. But I mean, this is a life and death thing. It's risky. Right. So the system should be doing that. And also, Families not knowing what's going on with their loved one who's incarcerated because the system's not communicating. They're letting people to communicate on the outside. Uh, and a lot of places have been on lockdown. They can't get out. They can't make, get out of their cells to make calls and do different things. So people are staying in their cells for 24 hours, seven days a week for weeks at a time. Longer than usual. Isolated with no communication, no access to family for weeks at a time. They're wanting to know, is their families okay? When people get locked down, how do you expect them to get access to their family? They have a rolling cart that they, that they roll around for the hearing people. 
right? They go from door to door, cell to cell, and they open the hatch and they put the phone inside. The person's able to make a call verbally. And then they pass the phone back through the hatch, close it, and go to the next cell. And they go down the pod like that. But for deaf folks, they're not doing that with video phones or interpreters. They just don't have it. Even when a deaf person says, hey, do you mind if I walk down the hall and use the video phone just to chat real quick with my family or call my attorney? They're saying, no, everything's on lockdown. You have to stay in your cell. Wow. Wow. So that's one of the many examples that we have. Uh, I think we we're going to show one video and we're gonna copy sign. Maybe there's just not enough. Not the full video, video, but just one clip. OK. Uh, I'm gonna do a picture description. It's a white man with a blue shirt on, with a white blue shirt and white underneath shirt, glasses, sitting close to the video phone, signing. Uh, I'm Malik. This person's name is A, and he's signing. So when I sign A, that means that person signing. And I signed MM, that means I'm signed. So, Esperanza, I have a question here. So, Esperanza, talking, would you hold on for a second? Um, could you explain to the audience, why aren't we showing the actual video? Like, why are we doing, you know, why do we have this this way? You know, for now, you know, the person that we've recorded, they're still, they're currently incarcerated, right? So now, you know, if we were to show that videotape to the audience, that would be making it public, and that would put them at risk, right? That, you know, risk for, you know, for uh, retaliation or, or other, um, you know, other issues. So we want to kind of respect their safety um, and, and of course their confidentiality. And so, you know, we want to respect the anonymity of that individual. So I just wanted to explain that that's why we're not showing the video itself. We would like to, uh, but it's just not safe for, for A as it were. So, you know, that's why we're sort of doing some copy signing here. So TL quickly adding, you know, just, you know, just, you know, to, you know, so we use the video here. So um, we, we did get approval from, uh, from A to use this video. So they, they did say that it's all right. This is Malik signing. I asked A, what is COVID-19? And A's response was, I think it's like the flu or something. Malik signed. What does that mean to you, though? What does COVID-19 mean to you? He says, um, like uh, sinuses, sore throat. I, I really don't know. I think that's all. Malik signs and explain what COVID-19 is, kind of gave it in depth a uh, description. A says three weeks ago, um, well, I was thinking you should know by now, it's been since March that COVID-19, you know, and, uh, but that person didn't know what COVID-19 was. So often on the hotline, what happens is we talk to many different people who are incarcerated and they're not wearing masks. And I ask them, where's your mask? And they say, oh, I left it in the cell. And they'll go and get it, and then they'll sit down and show it to me at the table. And the table, you know, it's they put it on a table, so it's contaminated, and they put it back on their face. So that's kind of a short synopsis of what I explained to the AO on the phone, but I do that all day. I'm going to show you the next uh, video clip. A uh, man who has... Uh, who, you know, talk about his organization and what he's been through in prison and the prison system uh, and how it's impacted his life. I'm going to show you that next on the slide. So TL here. We just have, we have nine minutes left. So I think we, uh, maybe we just want to quick do a, a wrap up, you know, summarize, talk about our work. Um, and then, you know, we need to, need to make sure we, you know, we send out our thank yous to everybody, you know, mention everybody who's been involved, you know, we appreciate, um, you know, all of the, all people who've made this possible. So, um, 
you know, any other thoughts that you have, you know, just to, to wrap up, you know, with that little bit of time left, you know, I know we had a couple of videos, um, but I think we, you know, we want to kind of make sure we, we show uh, appreciation for people's time, so. So I think now it's a good time to talk about what, you know, what can community members do? People are here, they want to know, they, they're getting some understanding. Audience is motivated, they're saying, come on, what can I do to get involved? How can I participate? You know, so Malik, how can community members get involved? So HERD is the only organization nationwide uh, who has a database that tracks uh, deaf and hard of hearing people who are incarcerated. And we'll post that soon um, for folks who, if you want to know where there are concentrations of deaf people in prison for their families or whatnot, you can use that link and you can access information and put information in. And that will really help us if you add information uh, in the database so that we can look and we can work with families and uh, partner with different people hearing organizations across the country to make sure that those folks are getting what they need and fight the system. So videos like today, um, continue to watch and learn more about this work. Uh, we have a lot of information to share with you. Uh, this is really just a, a rudimentary webinar um, for you to learn just the basics about you know, unpacking, doing things, uh, dialogue, uh, talking right, with folks, friends, you know, family, open up discussion, yeah. really. Uh, teachers, please discuss with your students and empower your students to start these dialogues in, in mass incarceration and that they would understand about the prison system. Um, so really just empower your students, to talk, talk about these subjects. Use hashtags and share uh, things on social media. For example, uh, hashtag death in prison. We use that a lot. Um, you can access information just by clicking on that hashtag. We drop a lot of stuff on there on social media. Interpreters, um, if you're an interpreter and you're watching and learning today, uh, please, it's very important for us to work with you and make sure that um, communication is clear. Often interpreters checking in with deaf, deafblind, hard of hearing folks just to make sure that um, the accommodations are accessible because across the country, um, ASL is not always accessible. So going into prisons, going into jails, providing access, but learning the terminology that goes along with that. For example, jail, this is the sign for jail, but this also can be the sign for inmate, uh, warden. Uh, different signs that are associated with prison, that's an example of providing, um, you know, appropriate signs. We want to make sure that people who are going into jails and prisons are asking the deaf people who they're interpreting for, or, you know, if they're being clear, um, if they understand, um, all those things. Yeah, Esperanza here. I just wanted to add to that. You know, that's why it's so important for the community to stay, you know, to really work in solidarity with each other, you know, help sharing resources, you know, it's important that we kind of, we, we need to be sensitive to the, to the importance of, you know, doing that kind of taking care of ourselves, but also taking care of our community members and, and being supportive of each other. Um, and, you know, I want to invite, you know, police officers, uh, you know, people who are part of that system, you know, I encourage, you know, the community to be involved in our community, you know, to do that kind of support. Oh, hold on, the interpreter misunderstood TL saying we got a little bit of um, interpreter mis misread something. 
the interpretation was incorrect. We do not want to invite police officers into our community. Something very important that you can do is not invite the police officers. Work on community solidarity, working within our own community instead of making use of those you know, resources. So relying on neighbors, you know, having those, those people that are involved in our everyday lives instead of inviting police officers or in the system, authority of any kind, you know, thinking, oh, well, they can help, they can collaborate us, you know, that's, that, that just, that just isn't right. working. You know, when you get police involved, you know, oh, I'll invite the police, but that, you know, they're not there to support deaf and disabled, you know, people who are incarcerated or not. It's not worth it. You know, invite your community members into those dialogues. You know, that's how we can advance, you know, our cause here of, you know, dealing with this, the, the carceral system. Go ahead. So Tio Fang, I think it's important that we really center the stories and lives of black, brown, indigenous, you know, make sure that those stories are the ones that are being at the center, you know, the generations of experience, you know, so many, you know, white led deaf organizations, you know, seem to be at the forefront, you know, but they end up perpetuating that kind of oppression, you know, oh, we have to, uh, you know, you know, reform the system, you know, make sure that it benefits all of us, black, white, brown, rich, poor, you know, we need to really, you know, challenge it. You know, white people in deaf and disabled communities need to stand up and say, no, enough of that kind of talk. We cannot accept to continue the, you know, the continued oppression of black and brown indigenous communities. You know, we need to be sure that, you know, the people who are most impacted by the prison system, people who are black and brown, indigenous and so on, they need to be at the center of our movement. You know, those are the people who keep getting thrown out of these mainstream organizations. We need to name that, you know, for some examples, you know, really that ends up being harmful. You know, we, you know, you know, oh, you know, uh, deaf, you know, let's get special licenses for deaf and hard of hearing people. Oh, you know, something that I wear on my wrist that says, oh, I'm deaf. And, you know, you know, all this list of like these regular, you know, these regulations, you know, oh, I just give it to the police, you know, for my, you know, so here's how things should work. No, like that's just, that does not help us. What we need to do, we need to think about, you know, we need to respect our communities, our own stories, you know, our, you know, and to, to really work on not just reducing harm and involving, you know, prioritizing those communities. The point here is transformative justice. That's the approach we need to take. That's the approach that really values you know, when we talk about harm reduction, you know, you know, especially with regards to addiction, you know, so often with addiction, the point is just punitive. We just, you know, toss people in jail. We need to look at these other options. You know, these white led movements, you know, often they're just not, they're not doing enough work on that kind of self analysis. So, you know, I, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to get that out there. Esperanza talking, yes, you know, investing in our communities, you know, you know, figuring out what our communities need, providing support. Maybe some people need help, you know, getting housing, getting food, you know, anything, mentorship, yes, you know, yes. all of these kinds of opportunities. You know, every little bit that we can do to help build up our communities, that's what helps us. This is Malik Simon. We need to, instead of partnering with the police, we need to develop partnerships with social workers. Often when you call 911, the they dispatch police officers first, which is really a conflict with people who have mental health issues. But instead, maybe partner with social workers. Yes, first thing, yes. So, um, you know, they use force and people will die. But, you know, partnering with the police is not the, the solution. You need to partner with other people. Can you repeat that? Can you have him sign that again for me? This is Scott, the interpreter. I missed. Um, the last part is okay. No, Tia. Um, uh, Malik, would you? The last part of what you just said, could you repeat that? The interpreter said he missed it. Oh, uh, Esperanza signing here. I've got you. Um, so you might know someone who's currently incarcerated, you know, continue to be there for them. You know, that's one of the best things we can do is to stay in touch and stay connected. You know, you know whether they're in prison or not, you know, keeping that, you know, keeping them in the loop, you know, it's so easy when someone is incarcerated, they wind up being isolated, they wind up often being forgotten, make sure that you're staying in touch, providing that support, sharing that information, making sure that they're aware, you know, you know, it's so important that we that we support our, you know, incarcerated uh, people. Um, and yes. Felix, could we talk a little bit about Felix Garcia? Right.
uh, writing letters um, to somebody named Felix, uh, who is, uh, so we're gonna drop a link of where you can write him, send him letters and show him support. And uh, he needs to be released from prison. So if we can garner support uh, to the pardon board or the court system where he's at to release him, we need to do that. He needs to get out of prison. That's something that the community can do to help yeah. Felix Garcia out. And there's a webinar tomorrow, says Tia, the National Disability Rights Webinar. And that, as Veronica's talking here, National Disability Rights Network uh, is, providing, is providing a webinar tomorrow. And uh, Jay Woody, um, and he'll be joining. It's, it's you know it's great if you get a chance to join and provide support and see what they have to say too. Uh, he himself is a formerly incarcerated person, so just um, we'll post a little bit more information about that later. Last thing in a nutshell, uh, disability organizations and organizations and agencies across the country need to work together and fight against racism, classism. Uh, and other antagonism, trans antagonism, and, and other things that uh, against the system. Um, that's why it's important to partner uh, the community to fight against the system. And so that's Veronica, make sure that you're contributing. You know, the financial aspect matters. Correct. You know, you know, with that, you know, financial support allows us to to develop more, you know, of our programs and to provide more support. So TL, uh, can we go through thank just you. some thank you to all of the people who've been part of this. Esperanza speaking here, so thank you. Before we close, I just want to send out a quick thank you to everybody who's been involved, you know, right now, you know, um, and, you know, the formerly incarcerated people who, you know, were had the courage to join us to share their stories with us, you know, just, you know, so much. Brandon Cobb, thank you so much for your participation today. Jay, Woody, thank you for sharing your, your, your message, your video, the video we weren't quite able to share. Um, and of course, we just want to recognize the struggles that all of the, you know, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people have gone through. You know, we, we value that. Um, we also want to recognize Maria Dahlhoff, uh, a formerly incarcerated artist, uh, a deaf artist herself. And she's done a lot of the artwork that you've seen heard uh, distribute uh, some of our, um, you know, some, she's, you know, a lot of deaf disabled uh, incarcerated folks have sent us art. So we're so grateful to Maria for the art that she has contributed to us. Uh, and you know, our very small, uh, but very, very committed team here at HERD. Um, you know, we have people who invested a lot of time and energy into this webinar. You know, everyone who developed the plan. Um, Kai, she got all the, all the questions and answers. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to do our q and I'm very sorry, but we'll do a follow-up with all of your questions and make sure things get answered. So thank you, Kai, for collect, collect, correct, collecting all of those. Uh, Micah, thank you so much for doing the live tweeting. Really appreciate, you know, so keeping that that stream going on Twitter. Malik, thank you so much for, you know, all of the preparation you did for all, you know, presenting all this information. Uh, thank you to me, of course, for writing, you know, doing work and being thank involved. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, up next, uh, I want to thank uh, Shelby for keeping time and, uh, you know, recording everything and making sure, you know, everything got coordinated properly. Thank you so much, Shelby. Uh, TL, thank you so much for supporting all of, you know, supporting everything, making sure this webinar happens. Yes, yes. Support coordinating accessibility efforts. Thank you so much. And for all of your work for, you know, 10 years that you've invested into her. So thank you so much for all of your effort. And uh, Roxanne, you know, thank you for getting, you know, the, the beautiful video uh, that we were able to show. Thank you so much. It's just absolutely inspiring. Thank you. And um, you know, of course, uh, supporting our accessibility needs, making sure that everything got, got put together. Thank you. And a big thank you to our communication access team. Tristan, one of the voice interpreters. Scott, another voice interpreter. Uh, LaShonda, who is one of our Spanish voice interpreters. Monica, one of our other Spanish voice interpreters. William. And Danae, who did the captions. So all of our team, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience. Thank you everyone who joined us today. It's so important that you were here to hear this discussion. You know, there's so much more work to do, so much more conversation to be had. So we look forward to partnering with each and every one of you. Thank you. And, oh, one more thing. So we, um, so we, have, we will have a recording of this webinar. We'll be posted later. So if you missed any part of it, you wanna come back and you wanna watch it again, it will be available. This is uh, Blake again. <laughs>
Come on. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Love you. And just to let you know, uh, this discussion with the community, um, we need to end mass incarceration. And this is going to help continue to try to end mass incarceration. So um, pass this along to future generations. Our big ASL translation about mass incarceration is going to be with uh, Deaf Queer Resource Center. Council de Manos, C5, and what's that? Deaf Natives. Deaf Natives. Uh, so be on the lookout for that work coming soon. And then yes. DBSA. Also, um, we're going to take a break for a week to her team just to kind of do self-care. Um, so if you don't see any emails from us until uh, a week or two, uh, and also please take care of yourselves and have a great afternoon. Much love to everybody. Stay safe, everyone. And stay stay safe. safe. Wear your mask and wash your hands. <laughs>